to have some discussion. So, yes, well, welcome. Um, my name is Richard Miller, and I'm, uh, I'm at Osaka Jogakuen University. Uh, today we're going to be talking about international relations. And I'll stop it a few times, and I'm going to ask you some questions and see what you think about some of these. So the first question I have is, this is a map of the world. I always like to ask this question of students. And how, without Googling, of course, we're on the computer without using your iPhone or asking Siri, what is... Um, what is the, uh, how, many, how many countries in the world are there? How many countries in the world are there? Uh, I guess 195. Oh, very nice answer. That is a, that's almost a perfect answer. I think it's now 196 official countries, right? According to the United Nations. And, but 195, 196. But you know, what if somebody said there are 200? Are they wrong? This is a, this is something I usually try to quiz students on. Um, are they wrong? You know, I think that it's, it's an interesting concept. And I know we may have, we have some students coming from uh, some countries that it's a little bit sensitive. So I don't want to get into too many details, but certain countries, uh, they, they, they exist, but others say they don't exist. So a couple of examples is, you know, for example, North and South Korea, is that one country or two countries? Uh, what about Taiwan and uh, China? Again, I don't want to get into details. I'm just, it's just a question. It's not a, it's, I don't expect an answer. What about, you know, uh, there's Western Sahara and uh, it's, it's trying to make its own country. What about Quebec and Canada? I'm from Canada and that gets everybody excited. So, you know, we roughly say there's a roughly 200 countries in the world because Palestine is one of those that's a very challenging situation, recognized by many, but not all. There's also Somaliland uh, for those of us from East Africa. So there's there's a whole bunch of things, but generally we could say uh, 200. Um, 195, though, I do like that answer. And 196 is actually uh, the one that most nushi, if if we were if we were to dare to put it on an exam, would be there. But yeah, so if we looked at that, uh, we're looking at about 200 countries in the world. And how do they interact, and what do they do? You know, a long time ago, uh, at one of the very first uh, political philosophers thought up this, you know, there was a, his name was Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes was a British, and he thought of humans, or see, he thought of countries as humans. We didn't actually call them countries back then, but he would, he would think of it as like, a, can, can a country actually be like a, a single person? So on the cover of his book, he had a, it, 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 his book was called Leviathan. Leviathan, of course, is a, a big monster. So does the state become a big monster? And if it's a big monster, can it be like a single person? And do they act like single people? This is something that we can think, you know, this is something that gives us a, a starting point to think about. So would a country like the Vatican, right? Smallest country in the world, how does it compare to China, the largest country in the world by population? How do you know, do they, do they kind of, so it becomes a little bit complicated if you're thinking about that would be like a, a one millimeter person versus a, a monster that would be, you know, 10, 10 stories tall. So uh, they don't actually compare that well, but it is, it does give us a way to think about it. And when we have uh, international relations, we start to realize when you read the newspapers, you'll notice that most of the time there are things that, that, uh, that don't, that, you know, for example, what happens in, in Burundi um, doesn't always make it to our news. But what happens in other countries like that are very close to us in Korea, uh, South Korea, in North Korea, uh, that often makes it to the news right away. And, you know, this so th th it depends on where we are. But of course, the world has become much smaller. And these are things that we need to um, recognize. And how, have it, how has it become smaller? It's become smaller in a whole number of ways, but it really started to become smaller about 200 years ago. And what happened 200 years ago? There were a number of different technological changes that happened and the technology really made the world much smaller. And of course, it's continued to get smaller. And 10, 15 years ago, we couldn't imagine how small it would become. And we're here on Zoom. We have, I just got some messages from students from Burundi. They're joining now. They, they're, they're asking me how to join. Uh, there's students from Kenya, China, you know, and uh, all over. And we're 
in like one classroom. So again, these are things that were, you know, if you watched cartoons back in the 1960s, they, you know, there was, it was like this and it was bizarre. It was something that could never happen, but of course it did happen. So the world has become much smaller. What happens though is when it became much smaller, when it became much smaller, internet, air travel, we thought that the world became a single global village, right? It became a single global village. And, you know, when it becomes a single global village, now we start to, you know, uh, the, uh, the ideas are making the world a much smaller place. But is that true? And for this year, 2020, has been a really interesting time. Not, not, a, not a, interesting can be very bad too, but it can be a very interesting time. And if we look at the world from post COVID until now, we start to realize that things weren't exactly the way that we thought they were going to be. We thought the world was one tiny country and one global village. Well, is that true? Let's, let's think about that as we go through. So when we look at a political map, we, we can see all the different countries. And this is our, you know, this is a map of, of 195, 196. Yeah, it's, no, it does not. Oh, it does have South Sudan. Um, oh, it's got Western Sahara. If you look on the Northwest part of, of, uh, of uh, Africa. And so these are like, uh, Western Sahara is actually not a country uh, as of yet, not a recognized country and so on. So there's uh, this is a political map. And you have to remember that often political maps don't, always represent the reality of what people wanted or people were used to. These were maps that were, these are borders that were made just because of different reasons. And you know, Japan, if you're in Japan now, we're on an island, it's pretty obvious. New Zealand was a great example from Monday. You know, another island nation, it's quite simple to see, well, this is the border, but is it, right? So there are some border disputes with our neighbors here in Japan border disputes with Russia, with Korea, and with China. So we, we have definite, uh, you know, definite disputes about which is our border and which isn't. And so that brings us into this whole idea of, well, things, things were supposed to be very much uh, globalized and very, you know, we should be able to, to negotiate or we should be able to understand these things because, well, there's laws, aren't there? There's an international law and the law says this. So if I go to your house or I come, you know, and I, and I go inside of your house and I decide, oh, I'm going to take, I don't know, I'm going to take your TV. Well, there, the police will come and you know, and I'm going to be in big trouble. So that's sort of the way that law works. If we think about law, we think about a police. The police will be here, and if we do something bad, the police will come. And I'm, I'll show you a picture. I think, uh, yeah. So this is this is a sort of anarchy, right? So this is there's no police. But generally speaking, that doesn't happen very often. Of course. This year, 2020, <laughs> this was very like a symbol of the world. So the whole world became very confused. And, you know, it's interesting because anarchy is the word that I'll ask you. I'm going to ask you to think about uh, for your discussion questions and, and what, what does it mean? But anarchy has sort of reigned, has sort of gone across the world. And it's, but it's always been there. What do I mean by it's always been there? Well, what it means is that if we go back to the world, the world, the world maps have, uh, they have not, you know, there, there are no police for the world, really. There's no real police for the world. We could say, oh, no, no, there is America. Now, I'll talk about America in a few minutes because it has been the world's police. The problem, though, is what happens when the world's police doesn't like you, right? And it becomes a real issue. And if you think I'm, you know, and, and I just have to show, I have to say, I'll name two countries recently that the world police were bullying, right? I mean, there's no other way to say it. But if we think about Iraq, and then we also think about Libya, those are two countries that were their own country, they're very much their own place, it's their house, and the police came and made it very confused. And I'm not going to say if it's 
for a good reason or a bad reason or any of that, just something to think about is they did it. And why did they do it? Because they thought certain things. They thought the leadership, and I, basically the leadership of both were really driving this sort of problem that occurred. And, you know, I'm sorry to say, I, I, you know, I, I know some Libyan people, I know some Iraqi people, and they're really nice people. And I, I very much, do, I mean, I'm always very shocked to see how when it, people get get into a kind of confusion and anarchy. So, you know, um, I'm always hopeful for peace, but getting back to international relations, let's, let's just look at that as an idea. There are no police for the world, really. So without the police for the world, other than the self-described police like America, that means that the world is basically in anarchy. And anarchy, again, I'll just show you the picture. This is anarchy. So you can almost think of the world like this. Each individual, each individual state has their own area, their own country, and nobody's really listening. And then somebody will say, but wait, what about the United Nations? What about the international courts, the world court? What about the IMF, the International Monetary Fund? That's for money. There's a whole bunch of things, mechanisms that definitely will apply. They definitely do apply. But gen but and and until COVID, we generally thought things were going to be much, much, much better, and we are going to be one nice, peaceful world. Unfortunately, COVID has the coronavirus has really shown that it's not happening the way we hoped it would. It's not happening the way that we hoped it would. So, because generally we were hoping that bad people, this is, a, I'm assuming I took, this picture has a, a bad person and the police came and the police, and this is a, for those in Africa, this is a, these are Japanese police. Um, they will, they came and they took the bad person. They surrounded the bad person and took the bad person away from the good people. And, you know, and then they, they put him into the jail. Uh, they, you know, they, they took care of that. So it was, became very safe and peaceful. The problem with the world is it's not quite that simple. And no matter what, you know, Thomas Hobbes said, uh, the Leviathan is not, it, it, it's a good way to think about things, but it's not always true. Although uh, another person, another uh, famous academic recently came up with a book from 2019 um, and it's Jared Diamond who came up with the, he came up with the idea of looking at the world, each individual state as an individual, as a person. So the ideas are still there. We're still there. But uh, the, the problem is, is it, it's much more complicated than that. So that doesn't always work. But, you know, COVID again has really shown that countries pull back. And if you want to see the difference, look at Canada and the United States. And if you were to look at the American president, uh, the way he treats the Canadians, um, you know, it's, it's quite different and it's quite shocking for the long, world's longest undefended border between Canada and the United States. I grew up in Canada. I could go to the United States with no passport, no problem. Uh, I lived in America for two years. I had a green card. It was very, very easy. Today, that has totally changed. And so the world has really started to step back. And I'll, uh, I'll explain a little more in a few minutes about what is going on. But the policeman of the world here is the policeman of the world. If we, if we can, if we can, uh, you know, and it's, it's really whether they, whether we agree or disagree, this really is the policeman of the world. And what they did was they had divided the world into uh, different sections. So you can see how they divided the world into different sections. And this was their way to police the world. And, um, you know, and it, there's been, some people will say that's been good because there have been no wars, but others, if, if you're from Libya, if you're from um, other countries like Iraq, I'm going to use those two examples because they're the most clear, but if you're from either of those two countries, I think you think differently. I don't think you think the police are doing a good job at all. So it really kind of depends on what you're what you're thinking of or what your perspective is. But this, this has all started quite a while ago. And um, 
getting back to the idea of the world and the police, this is a stock photo, but what happened two days ago or three days ago off the coast of the west, the far east coast of Africa is an oil tanker has spilled the oil, right? So it's interesting because, you know, if you watch the news, the Japanese have sent the Coast Guard. Why are the Japanese sending Coast Guard all the way over to Marcianus, which is on the east, way east of, uh, of um, um, way east of Africa. So it's, it's quite far. The reason, of course, is it's a Japanese ship. Even though the Japanese ship is a Japanese company, um, it, and it's not the, the country Japan, still the Japanese have a real, like, you know, there's this, this obligation to go and, and do something. So I'm not saying that international law doesn't work. It still works and it still has a lot of pressure. It just kind of depends on which country and um, how it's applied. So it definitely does work, it still works, and the world is much more peaceful than it has been uh, for a, quite a long time. But this, the world, if we look at the world, and I'll just go back to this. So if we look at the world, and we look at, the, uh, at, at this map of the world, and, and I quite like this map of the world, because it's got Burundi very clearly written, although the country itself is, is a beautiful little country in kind of the center. Um, however, that's where most of our students are coming from. But it's a landlocked country. And for the longest time, the biggest powers of the world were all on the ocean, right? So it was all by the ocean. Why was that? Well, if we think about what it was like um, 100 and 300 years ago on to about 150 years ago, if you had the sea powers, you can imagine on the left side, that's the American flag, and there they are. And by the way, that photo or that painting is from North Africa. When the, Amer when the American Marines went to North Africa, there were some pirates there. It was in the early 1800s. And they, they actually, um, they defeated the, the Barbary coast, the Barbary pirates, who were asking for money from the American ships after the British had lost the war of independence against the United States. So the newly independent country actually went up to, uh, to the coast, it was the coast of Libya again, and, um, and actually had that, that was their, the Marines' first big fight. Um, so, but at that time, the, the pirates were actually choking off they were choking, they were stopping a lot of the trade because they would board ships, they would take them. We think of Pirates of the Caribbean as kind of, you know, nice, but they were very, very, very nasty people at the time. So the sea power was the big, big, um, the big power. And that, you know, and if we looked at some of the earlier powers, I'm going to talk a little bit about the big powers and what some of them and how it has shifted over the years. Um, but if you look at, so for example, the Spanish, they had the Spanish fleet. So the Spanish were the big power. The Portuguese were a very large military power, even the Dutch. It was all because of the, it was mostly because of the sea power. Of course, the French grew and grew and they had a big navy. And if you look at how the history worked, they were, they were um, dominant on the seas until Great Britain. Great Britain was the one that had, uh, that had um, dominated for quite a long time. And this had spilled over. This had spilled over and it continues. And we're going to come back to this in a few minutes. But the, the, uh, the World War, uh, since World War II, the powers have um, been looking at two different ways, sea power and land power. Prior to World War II, though, the land power was the big power. This is, this is the British, this is the British, and this is the British Empire. And you can see how their, their uh, marine trade, they had, this is where the, the sun had never set on the British Empire. And uh, Professor Ritchie grew up in New Zealand, over in the corner. I grew up in Canada, and, you know, uh, I grew up with the Queen's picture in my classroom. I'm not sure about uh, New Zealand, but we certainly did. I'm sure Australia did, South Africa, there was India, all around the world. And a lot of that had to do with the sea trade. 
Later, um, so this became, this was sort of moving towards globalization. And this globalization movement, that's a word that we keep here, we kept hearing about until a few years ago, but globalization was the big, big push. And one of the reasons was the sea trade. You could move goods from, you know, for, you could move um, tea from China over to England. You could move things very quickly and very easily, all with ships. Those ships were powered by wind, and later they started to move into uh, into um, hydrocarbons, oil, and that brought us to the next. The end of the British Empire was coming up, and uh, there was a big theory about whether Russia was going to take over or not. So this really shaped the way that the world, the international relations, were really thinking about. There were big powers medium powers and little powers. So of course, um, the big powers were the ones that were, uh, that had expanded, they had colonies. So, you know, if, if for Burundians, they're very familiar. Burundi was first colonized by Germany. So the Germans had all of that area. So um, in, in 1885, at the Conference of Berlin, um, you know, Burundi was German. And it wasn't until uh, just over a hundred years ago with the defeat of the Germans in East Africa that they became Belgian. And so they started, you know, it became a French colony. So Belgium was an interesting one, a little tiny country that had all kinds of colonies. So they wanted to be one of the major players. And so did Japan, incidentally. So Japan was also expanding at that time. But the big ones were still England and France. Uh, Germany lost in World War I, but these big empires still had this leftover of world power. And so when you looked at the world power in this way, you know, we had Russia, which at one time went way over into North America, and it, it came back a little bit, but started to grow again. And you can see where this sea power had been all around the heartland. And this is where really where uh, there was a lot of theories and what the interest was, and the interest is back, I'm going to talk about that, why I'm talking about this is because it's 2020 and we have some new country, well, not new, it's an old, old, old country, but it has since regained its, its, its legs, shall we say. So from about the end of World War I until I would say Donald Trump, it's really been an American century. The, the name Pax Americana was by this guy. Uh, he was, uh, you know, Ronald Steele. And he, it, was, it was really a, a, the century of America. So America was the big century. And if we started looking at any of these, uh, I think it's, that might be backwards, but uh, any of the books that came out almost always were surrounding the theories of, with America at the center. And, the rival. There was one major rival. What was the rival? Well, if you, you know, um, I, I was in university, so it shows my age. Um, but I was, I was in university in uh, 1989. And I, I, my first degree was I studied economics, but not just any economics. I studied Soviet economics. So Soviet economics was all about the Soviet Union and East Europe. And so Soviet Union and East Europe were really like they, they, this land power was one of those big things. So East Europe. And when you grew up in the 1980s, like I did, it was a very, very, it was front and center because America was always the ones who said, we are the best. We are the right way. You should follow us. And they, they always promoted American values and how, you know, and they could because they could, they could afford it. They had the sea power and because they had the sea power and they were outside of the land power, they could really push their ways of doing things. So that's, uh, that's sort of some background about what it was and what happened after the end of the Cold War. So 1989, I go to my classroom. And I remember I had a professor and he was always going to the Soviet Union. I grew up in Ottawa, Canada's capital. 
not America. So we, we had like an economics department with a very unique studies. The unique studies was all about the Soviets. And it was quite interesting. I was studying about the Soviet Union. I was studying about East Germany, about uh, Czechlo the Czechoslovakia and how Czech, the Czech uh, economy was working East German economy versus West German economy and it was really interesting my father by the way was in the Canadian government and he was literally he was a spy uh, he was like a, an engineer but he would go to the like at that time he was on a computer and he was uh, you know he was you know he's he working for this agency they were watching the Russians and um, you know and I was studying about this and then uh, I went to the university and it was in November and the Berlin wall fell and that was it. I remember, but it was, and so my professor <laughs> was very shocked and he came in and he was really surprised. And he said to me, he said to the class, cause it was like a third year class. It was like almost like a Zemi class. He said, we give up. We can't do any more Sotseron about, about East Germany. But actually it was interesting because afterwards there was lots of interesting things about East Germany that weren't true. So it was quite an interesting, uh, it was still quite interesting, but basically America won, right? So Francis Fukuyama had a book called The End of History, talking about how all other ideas, all other forms of government don't work, only the American system. And to make sure the American system works, we have to do, we have to, uh, be the policeman and by being the policeman we need to make sure that there's democracy american values and freedom throughout the world how do you do that well they've set up bases all over and like if you look at uh, they they claim only one actually i know this is not true this is from the uh this is actually an official one from the i think from the state department but department of defense but actually i know for sure in canada there's more than one but but in any event so this is uh this really shows how the um the american bases are everywhere right we've got 73 101 but if you've ever been to okinawa and for those in africa you, you, Okinawa is a really uh, tropical, beautiful place. It's gorgeous. You go to this really nice beach. You're on the beach, right? And you know, it's just a beautiful day. And suddenly you hear this airplane, like not, like not a air, like a shockingly loud airplane. It's like, whoa. And it comes really down and it goes back up and then more. And it's, it's the American military. So the American military is is all over the world. And the, uh, Okinawa is like one of those examples. Of course, near Tokyo is a, another place. So that just kind of shows you that you can see that in Japan, 73, right? So it is just absolutely everywhere. And, um, you know, the, because the, the American mindset, the American ideal is that they are the policemen because there's no other policeman. Again, the problem though is the question then becomes, who's the policeman to the policeman? And what happens when you've got a leader like, we, I'll say Bush 43. Bush 43 is, is George W. Bush, and Bush 41 was George H. W. Bush. And you know, George H. W. Bush actually went into Kuwait, had a, had a war with Iraq, pushed them out, and then left. Bush 43 went into Baghdad, you know, and you know, if you know, I mean, this is, if you, anybody knows, uh, you, if you, just, you just watch the news and it's just absolutely horrible how Baghdad fell. And, um, you know, and so what happens when the policeman is like that? Or even more frightening is what about the policeman now? Is Donald Trump, except that policeman has said, no, thank you. We don't want to be the policeman of the world anymore. So Trump has actually started to pull back from the world, which is creating interesting other problems, which I'll try to touch on before we get to the end, because it's a really interesting time to see that America is supposed to be pulling back. They're not pulling back. They're not pulling back, meaning leaving some of these and going back to America, but they are going, they are pulling back. Interesting too, though, is how much money this all costs the American economy because it's an, a very 
very heavy burden, heavy burden, very heavy, very hard for people to, uh, to for the, con the government to pay for all of this. So those are some of the issues. Uh, so, so those are some of the reasons that we have what's called, uh, you know, uh, which is a, a world order that is basically an American ideal world order in most of the, of, of, uh, the situations. Of course, Again, lots of failures, right? Lots of failures. Uh, you know, Somalia, you know, in Mogadishu, the American Marines were killed in 1993, and then there was no intervention in Rwanda in 1995. It's 1994, sorry, 1994. So, you know, you don't have this, like, you don't have, um, there's, there's, the, the, the Americans are very, they, they want to choose, well, this is what we want to be involved in, and this is what we don't want to be involved in. So, it, you know, it, again, if you're, uh, it, 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 for some people, from some point, this is very good, but from other points, it's very difficult. And if you think about the, you know, if we go back to the Leviathan, we think about people and each country, all, there are 200 people in the world. You know, why is one person in so many places? They have 800 bases around the world. I think China has China up until recently only had two. I think they have a, a third or a fourth now, but they, they have a much smaller number. Yet, if you listen to the American media, you think that they are everywhere. So it's, it's again, very interesting to see the, the differences in opinions. So opinions count. And, you know, um, this is, uh, the, so there, again, 873, that was a year and a half ago. Um, they're, they're supposed to pull back. Uh, America has, has said they're pulling back. Trump has, has claimed he's pulling back. So when America pulls back, who is there to take its place? And we keep hearing about this, oh, this is so bad. It's, you know, I mean, excuse me, if you're in America, American media portrays, you know, this big shock. And China is a very interesting uh, economy, dynamic. I lived in Hong Kong for one year, absolutely loved, uh, loved going to China. Um, so it's, you know, Chinese people and Chinese culture and food, it's always been really an enjoyable, great experience to go and to live. And I've been to universities. However, if you, if you listen to the American you know, press, it's, it's this horrible thing, this terrible thing that's happening. And, you know, uh, TikTok is, is going to be banned in, uh, for those of you who know what TikTok is, it's, it's you know, it's going to be banned in, um, in, in America soon. <sighs> you know, and, and, you know, you got to think, well, wait a minute. If you ban things like TikTok, if you, if you start to cut ties and you pull back, things like our Zoom, uh, cheap clothes, all of these things start to become a lot more expensive and a lot less good. So the parts of globalization have been able to give us things that we couldn't imagine before. However, some of the costs are jobs and so on. So there, there's a bit of a balance. Um, however, but when we talk about international relations, the money is extremely important, right? So who has enough money to do certain things? We think about hard Hard power or soft power? Hard power is the guns, right? So I have, a, I have an airplane, I have an air, aircraft carrier, which the Americans have sent to Taiwan recently. So I have an aircraft carrier, I will come here. I'm from Canada, we don't have aircraft carrier. We have old broken airplanes, well, I shouldn't say that, but we have some, you know, very old things. Our submarines are not so good. So, you know, we don't have a lot of money because it's a small country in population. Um, so that means we're not that powerful in the world in that sense. But we have what's called soft power. And for example, if we think about Japan, Japanese soft power, when I go to Africa, everybody thinks, oh, you know, people know about JICA. They know about uh, manga, they know about anime, they know about Toyota. So some of those, the, those brands become soft power. and People have an image, oh, yes, we like it. Japan also has soft power when it comes to nuclear weapons, right? So today is, I think, the anniversary when, you know, 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. I, it might be the 14th, but, you know, 
So 75th anniversary of Nagasaki was just a couple of days ago. And then a few, few days before that was Hiroshima. So Japan has really taken its soft power and said, you know, no nuclear weapons, please. Because if you have nuclear weapons, look what happened to my city. And, you know, if going to Hiroshima, and for those in Africa, if you get a chance to come to Japan, you really should go to Hiroshima. I've been to Hiroshima many times. I've been to Nagasaki. And, you know, within there, you can really see some of the problems. But that's soft power. That's real power. So they have a lot of influence in the area. The other areas of soft power, of course, as I mentioned, JICA. So Japan will lend money or, you know, do things. And sometimes the soft power is... Is, is used in other ways as well. For example, Lebanon has a lot of problems today. And there's a, the former, for those of you who know, the former leader of uh, Nissan, Carlos Ghosn, he went back to Lebanon and the police in Japan want him to come back here. So Japan has actually suggested that they won't give money to Lebanon unless Carlos Ghosn comes back. But they actually haven't done that yet. So hopefully they won't. So what the money, the money becomes very important. And again, you know, Japan's a great example. But I remember I was teaching economic class at uh, Konan University, which uh, is in, uh, is in uh, Kobe. Actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice little university. But the one I was at was in a city called Nishinomiya. It was a Konan Cube, which is an economics department, management department. And I remember the students were very disappointed because Japan was always number two, but Japan became number three. This was in, I think, 2012, so maybe 11. Anyway, Japan became number three. And I had to explain to the students that it's quite natural that a country like China with growing economies would become number two. And it's no surprise because China's population is much bigger than Japan's, right? Japan's population, 125 million and falling, right? China's 10 times bigger, 10 times bigger. So when you've got a population that's 10 times larger, you know, it's, it's hard to be number, number two and they're trying to catch up because this is overall. So it's no surprise. And Japan, China's, pop, China's economy continues to grow. So China, has become very, very important. And, um, you know, when you think about China and America, then we can see there's some, they're not so friendly anymore. Big changes, big, big changes. So it's, it's important, and I'm not going to comment on, you know, any, any well, I think I can comment on Trump, but uh, I'm not gonna be commenting on other leaders at this time. But, uh, you know, if we look at it, this is where we really have some issues. But look at how fast China's growing, and China's continuing to grow. So uh, if we look at different ways of describing Chinese growth and Chinese economy. Some say it's already above America. Some say it's a lot lower because of their debt problem and some other problems that they have in their economy. Very, very hard to tell what, where, where it is. However, it's growing very quickly and their influence has been growing as well. So um, if you look at the way it's been growing, um, here is China and this is PPP. So PPP means how much to buy one, I'll say Coca-Cola, because we have, we, have uh, we have students in Africa. So we think about one Coca-Cola, how much is it in Burundi francs? How much is it in Japanese yen? How much is it in Canadian dollars? How much is it in New Zealand dollars? We look at those and then we can think, okay, so we start to calculate how much things cost. That gives us a better idea about where the economy is. So if we look at the PPP, right, at the PPP means of purchasing power parity, um, for, uh, for China, it's actually, um, well, it's, it's bigger. It's actually bigger than America from 2014 on. Again, it, it, that's kind of debatable, but soon there'll be no real debate if, the, if it continues. So, but if we, and so if we're looking at, uh, at this, this is a very interesting, interesting chart that shows how much. And here's another example. You're in a, a room or you walked to your uh, school and here's concrete, right? So this is interesting, I think. So this was a, a, quite an quite a, a example of 
how much China grows. So this is concrete, concrete for 100 years all over America. The bridges, the buildings, uh, the streets, everything. So 100 years, concrete. So it's this, this much, 4.5 gigatons, okay? China, 6.6 .6 gigatons, even more. But wait a minute, that's only in four years. What? So, so you, can see how, you can see how much bigger it is. Like we're talking four years, it's 50%, it's, it's almost 50% more than 100 years of America. So very, very different and uh, very, very big. So China is using its soft power in different ways. But it's not only soft power, it's also economic power. O-B-O-R. One belt, one road. One belt, one road. So that's the O-B-O-R. And O-B-O-R is, it's actually put on hold for 2020 because of the uh, COVID. But if you look at it from our perspective, if you're in Burundi, I was in Burundi, and you know, I was in Bujumbura, just outside of Bujumbura, the capital, and there's an Asian guy there. And sure enough, he's from Guangzhou. And it's like, hey, so, you know, it's, I, I was at, talking to him a little bit. I speak a little Cantonese. And, you know, he, he thought it was funny. This, this foreigner was there. But all over, if you're in Nairobi, in Nairobi, they have Chinese signs all over downtown Nairobi. And there's, uh, there's huge companies going in. And that is a very good example of the OBOR. So the OBOR is the one belt, one road. And um, you know, when you're in Kenya, for example, they have a, a beautiful train from Nairobi to Mombasa, and uh, you can go. It's very clean, very quick, and it's amazing when you look at the. I actually haven't been to Mombasa, but if you go to the Mombasa website, they, they show this the station. It looks like I don't know. It looks like China, and and of course it was built by Chinese, so that makes sense. So it's all across, and so they're lending money and they're developing and they're creating business all across the region. So that means that they get special visas, they give special visas, uh, the banks in Nairobi will lend money, and you can go to Guangzhou, Guangzhou is a big one, but you can go to Shanghai as well, uh, or any other major city, and, and buy goods, put them in your suitcase, bring them back to your city and sell them. This happens all over. And so we see the East, but it also is a big, big, um, it's, it's having a big impact on other Southern African countries, Z uh, Zambia, for example, N Nigeria. So all over, they're doing this. And of course, for those uh, who are um, from other Asian countries, and I know there's some Vietnamese students, you can definitely see all kinds of Chinese development. Is it bad or is it good? I, it's like Canadian development in the Caribbean, because Canada is a tiny country. I'll just give you, and I'm Canadian, so I can say it. So it, it, yes, it's good, and yes, it's not good. It can go both ways. It can be good or it can be bad, you know. It does have that effect. So they, um, being bad is where the Canadian company will make a resort, only Canadians work there, only Canadian food goes there, only Canadian money is used there. We fly Air Canada and they take a Canadian bus to a beautiful beach and then they come home. So no money goes to the local and the Canadian company uses the, their, their, you know, they, they use the garbage and they put all the stuff there. That is not such a good way. That is definitely not. So that's one example. If you can imagine that, what, what happens when development is not good. And I'm not saying... Uh, China is either doing that or not doing that, but it, it, these are issues that do that do come up, and those are things to, that we need to think about. So, and one example was Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka borrowed a lot of money from China, and they couldn't pay it back. So, what did they do? Well, what they did actually was they—I'll uh, come back to that one in a second. But uh, what they did was they uh, they gave uh, a whole port to them, and and there was, but in the American in the American. Uh, media, they were saying, it's like Hong Kong, it's like Hong Kong, except really, look at the size. So this is 15,000 acres, and Hong Kong is actually 273,000 acres. So it's hardly like Hong Kong, it's much smaller. Um, and America is very, very, very worried. But you, you know, where, where, I don't know, where's America? It's quite far away. But if you see this, I took this photo in Dubai, 
and you can see we bridge the gap between the Middle East and Africa. Now, Standard Charter is originally a British bank through Hong Kong became a Chinese investment bank. And you can see where they're doing all of this. One belt, one road, one bank. So the Chinese banks are running through some of the international banks, but the money's flowing. The money's flowing all across the region. So what does that mean? It means there's a change in the world policemen, right? And there's a change in the way that things are done. We just need to be very clear about uh, this change is going to happen. And whether we, you know, in America, they, they, they might have reasons that they're not happy with it or they might, but these are definitely happening as we speak. And, you know, if you're from Mombasa or you're from, you know, just if you're from Thika or anywhere in, in Kenya um, or, you know, some of these other places that are, that are even, even, you know, I stayed in a, in a hotel in Bujumbura, owner was Chinese. Uh, it was a well, really nice hotel. Um, you know, the, the service was good. Um, is it a bad thing? Uh, it's, it's really, um, I think that investment, free flowing investment is very important. And the way that free flowing investment works is it makes it better for everybody who's involved. That's sort of a globalization perspective. And that's what I'm, I kind of grew up on. And so for myself, my, you know, it's something that, that I would think would be a good thing. Um, others will say, no, we need to keep our, maintain our own country. We need, we don't need to have these big powers coming, you know, the big monster coming and fighting in, in our house. So those are the other ideas that people have. So which is better? Hard to say, but there is a very serious problem. And Alison Graham is a, is a Harvard University professor, and he has uh, explained that there is a thing called a Thucydides trap. And the Thucydides trap goes back to the Peloponnesian Wars, which is, you know, ancient Greece. And there was a rising power and there was a a, a power that was strong and they got into a uh, war because the rising power was the, the, the power, the, the main power, the, the, the entrenched power, the power that was already there has always, the established power was worried about the rising power. So they had a fight. This is what we need to be really worried about if America is, you know, is, uh, is there. So this is a, this is a concern and president Xi, has talked about it. President Obama has talked about it. Uh, President Trump, I don't think he could, uh, yeah, he, he, he hasn't talked about it. But he needs to know about it because it's very serious. Though, you know, it's easy to criticize Trump, but if you think about it, Trump hasn't really given us a war. And, you know, I was a big fan of Obama. This is one of Obama's major writers. Uh, this book was called The Long Game and how Obama and Washington, you know, redefined America's roles. And I'm sorry, but history is going to show Obama, you know, continued the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan. There was all kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's those are some of them that we could, uh, that are, uh, that are up for debate. But yeah, somebody had a question. Okay. Anyway, I, I, I'll be another or so and then we can have a discussion but 5th 12 of the 16 cases since 1500 when an established power has confronted a rising power the result has been a war so does it mean we're going to war now Allison Graham I'll, I'm going to give you a link to one of his uh, TED talks you know I have the book I have my book is all ripped up and marked in um, and I his, his conclusion is not necessarily, not necessarily. But the biggest problem was this book was written in 2018, published 2019, and COVID happened this year. And COVID has been a real challenge because it's really, you know, um, it's made a, a much, a big problem, excuse me, much worse. Because when we have problems, um, I'll put this on the website, by the way, um, but it, when, those problems are much worse when there's an economy that's bad. Bad economies really create uh, a lot more tension. Again, it kind of comes back to the money. If you come back to where the money is, this is a big concern. And if American economy is bad, it's easy for them to say, hey, you know, did, I mean, you know, America's decision, if we look at New Zealand, which we, their decision making meant that people were safe. They were number one in the world as far as COVID. They were very 
secure and their economy is going to be okay. America chose a different path, yet, and so the America is in big trouble and they're pointing fingers at other countries, they're pointing fingers at China. So is, is, it, is it a good thing? I don't think so. I don't think, I think any time you have this kind of uh, issue, it might be very, very serious. And we've kind of come back to a real, um, uh, a real, you know, kind of perspective of, well, it's America and this is, this is uh, where we're going to be coming, uh, you know, this is where we're coming from. We're going to pull back. So I'll very quickly talk about the problems with pullback. But just before I go there, if you look on the picture, Kevin Rudd was an Australian prime minister and he's last week, he actually wrote the newspaper and he said that he's worried about a war with China. It's, it's uh, between America and China. So it's a very difficult time right now. And, and I hope that more debate, more discussion will help to soften or make some of those problems more, more less serious. So um, this, this is the Thucydides trap. I'll let you read that at a later time. But one of the problems though, is if there's no, if there's no policeman, and I'll use the word policeman, I know there's lots of ladies. So if there's no police, then the world tends to go quickly towards war. And that came from this, uh, this is um, Charles Kindleberger. He was a, another Harvard professor who uh, was in Europe after World War II. And he was saying that before World War II, there were no police. And that's true, because England was, England had to pull back, really not much. So the uh, start of conflict was, this is what we would call the, uh, the Kindleberger trap. And that's, that's the worry that, that was the other worry that, that, uh, that has arisen. Is China, to, and they've been that they're not. So if, if, uh, if there is no Chinese police, there's no, the Americans leave, now what will happen? So this is another issue that, that comes up. But it all comes back to, you know, things that we need to think about um, and some of the things that we need to come together as a world and with international relations, we should be able to for certain things. And some of these, um, some of these are from last year. And I'm just going to mention a couple of these. So this comes from the United Nations. And we can he see here, safe airways for international travel, clean, you know, and uh, some of these other, you know, uh, other things which uh, eradication of diseases and epidemics across borders. So just there are two out of the five that are, have been really affected with COVID. So COVID has shown all of the, all the problems that we have, uh, the challenges that the world has, and how we have to really overcome them, and how COVID has really made it a big problem. So COVID has made a huge problem for, for uh, international peace, and international relations. Again, you know, we keep seeing this, you know, um, and it's, but the airlines, uh, Dubai airport is all closed now, right? So it's all closed. So, and against the backdrop of all of this, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have growing populations, populations continue to grow. Um, you know, some students had asked me, well, after COVID, the population will drop, won't it? And, you know, I had to point out that, you know, every single week, the population of the world increases by 1.4 million people. And if you're in Japan, that's the same as the city I live in. That's Kobe. I live in Kobe. So, but if you're not from Japan, 1.4 million people. I think it's like two, two and a half times larger than Bujumbura. So we're talking about a population every single week. So it's still growing by about 81 million people every year. So when you have COVID has affected, I think, what is it, 20 million now? I'm not even sure. I, I, I stopped watching. I stopped, tried to stop watching the news because it's too, too depressing. But COVID has probably affected 20 million people. Those are 20 million that are sick. So every year we get a new number of 81 million. So definitely COVID does not going to have an effect on the world's population. And um, so that is going to continue. We have this population, we got an economy that's gone down, and we've got, you know, a pullback from globalization. So those are also going to be very big challenges 
for diplomacy and for uh, you know for different international relations. Um, and you know you've also going to have we didn't talk so much about it, but oil, for example, you know, oh, the oil prices are down. Yes, but they won't stay down because population keeps pushing those up because people need oil. We need the energy. We need the transportation, the food processing, the every, everything. Everything your whole life is, is surrounded by that. So those things are, are going to continue to, to be, uh, to be uh, necessary. So we have a lot of different challenges that the world is going to have to really come together to think about. So those are some of the thoughts that I had uh, when, I, when I was thinking what we could talk about international law, globalization, and what it means. Because when we have a change, and we are, we're experiencing a change now from you know, uh, America, which was absolutely number one, for two decades, basically. It was, there was no competition. Not quite two decades, but mm, close to, now they have another you know power and russia has really come back so russia was kind of you know it was uh, it was over people were saying it's just an, a poor country well putin again leadership whether you like him or not has really pushed uh, pushed it back up we also have other countries like india so you you do have countries that that are keep that are keep that keep pushing forward and so that means smaller countries need to think about where do they want to go who do they want to you know be friends with i've always suggested in uh, in east africa that the eac if you're from japan it, it's kind of complicated but it's east africa community that's made up of six countries including burundi there's rwanda then there's uganda tanzania kenya and then south sudan so that block is very very powerful because they're together right united you stand and um that that's something that i think we have to see how the covid world plays out because right now there's a lot of trouble in a lot of the economies including America and so how how will things come at in a, in a year two years hopefully we call it a V right so things down things up so I'm hoping it's a V uh, difficult to say but hopefully it's a V and you know if that's the case then things could get back to normal so yeah um, okay so what I'll do then so is um, I'll open it up to um, discussions uh, professor Richie are you there or, um, um, I'm here. I'm here. Yep. Hello. Yes. Thanks. Okay, Zane. So, um, what I'd like to do is get get students into groups and um, just have a quick discussion. And so, some of the questions that I was thinking about is, you know, yesterday in America, the uh, the um, president Trump was complaining a lot about this lady, and I was like, who's he complaining about? Of course, it's Kamala Harris. So, if you don't know anything about American politics. Just remember, Trump has an election in November. Maybe he'll be gone. If he's gone, the other guy will, will the, the other guy against him is now Biden. So, and you know, so how will a new president, how will a new president change? How will a new president change? And um, that's the one question I have. Second question is, how has, how do you think COVID has affected the world how do you think covid has affected the world so what what's it done to some of the uh, some of your life and how has it affected you and how do you think it'll affect the country you're in so maybe we could break up into groups saying uh, you're the host oh i am i'm sorry okay everybody i'll make you yeah. up into groups and i would type the questions into